Okay. So let's start the second class, <coughs> Professor Paulo Dainese. Uh, as I said before, we will pass by another attendance list for his class. So please sign up and uh, you know, to up to the front. Thank you. Paulo. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning. Um, so this is the second talk that I'm giving. Uh, as I mentioned to you yesterday, the first talk was more like educational, more basic, so we went very slowly on uh, some of the uh, basic equations and mechanisms. Uh, this is more a research kind of talk. Okay, so um, this is the outline of my talk. I will start with um, a little bit of a general motivation to optical communications. Uh, um, at least for me, when I was a student, um, I wasn't very aware of how much photonics was really used in practice in, in different areas. Um, one of them is communications, and I just want to show you some, um, some examples, some uh, visual um, uh, uh, examples that you can um, actually see where this is used and uh, what's going to be in the future. And, um, and then I'm going to focus on our recent work. Um, primarily, I'm going to talk about why we are interested in photophono interaction. So you saw from Philip today some of the um, material uh, light interacting with acoustic waves. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then this specific paper here. Then I have other stuff that uh, we're also doing in the lab. And I know you guys are going to visit the lab. So I put the material in here more as a reference. Um, again, you guys are going to get the slides, so you can, you can take a look later. If we do have time at the end, I might scan through this quickly, but this is not the focus of uh, my talk today. Okay, so it's here more for information. Okay, so photonics is used quite a lot in many areas, particularly in communications. And there are some numbers that reflect that. I'm always amazed by these numbers. Uh, if you look at the volume of optical fiber that is sold, and this is, this is actually uh, every year, um, it's about 300 million kilometers of fiber uh, produced. And, and, and so that's twice the distance between this, the Earth and the Sun. Um, does that ring a bell? That, that's, that's a lot of fiber, right? Uh, it's about, oh, sorry. It's about 7.5 thousand turns around the Earth every year of fiber. So this is to connect everybody's homes and so on and so forth. So it's widely implemented. Um, why is it so that photonics is useful for communication? And it's a very simple reason. It has to do with its transparency. If you get, um, here are two examples of a twisted pair. Um, copper wire and then a coax copper wire and you look at the attenuation as a function of its frequency, of the carrier frequency, um, it gets pretty high soon. I mean, you increase the frequency from kilohertz to megahertz to gigahertz and uh, very quickly you get uh, lots of dBs per kilometers of attenuation. So this is the frequency of the carrier wave that, that is propagating through the, 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 the medium. Um, at the same time, if you get an optical fiber, you just break the scale here. Um, and again, this is loss in dB per kilometer, so the same scale. But the carrier frequency goes up to now 200 terahertz. And in addition, it's not only the carrier frequency, but it's the bandwidth itself. So it is transparent over about 100 terahertz uh, of, of bandwidth. And uh, therefore, you can transmit a lot of information in this bandwidth, and uh, that's the very basic reason why um, uh, glass fibers are so successful in communication, right? Um, if we just change the scale now to wavelength, I showed this chart yesterday briefly. Um, this is, again, loss in dB per kilometer, and now this is wavelength, not frequency. Um, and the attenuation spectrum of silica glass has a minimum at a, around uh, 1.5 uh, microns. And uh, the basic communication systems use a technique called WDM, so wavelength division multiplexing, uh, where basically you uh, multiplex or you combine lasers at slightly different frequency, each of them carrying a certain um, bit rate. 
and um, that is aggregated, and then you transmit that through the fire, but at the end you separate um, and something like this, right? So you have the different lasers, you combine, amplify, go through the fibers, and then separate again. So that's a very, uh, very basic, very uh, quick description of a communication system. Some numbers, very typical commercial system, you get something like two terabits per second uh, in total. So like 40 lasers, um, each of them carrying a 25 gig, so on and so forth, okay? So that's kind of, that's how a system, uh, commercial system looks like. This is, uh, if you remember uh, Brito's talk, this is one of the startups that, um, well, not a startup anymore, but a pretty large company, about a billion dollar, uh, billion high uh, company here that sells equipment. It's like rack size type of equipment. Right? Each of these little boxes is one laser and you combine of that and amplifiers, so on and so forth. And that's how uh, a system like that looks like. Okay, but this is commercial. How about in research? Um, this is a paper that was just published um, at ECOC last year. And uh, from the two terabits per second that I mentioned, they demonstrated a record of 2.15 petabits per second uh, in one fiber. So this is a multi-core fiber. Each of these little dots here represent one core. Uh, there are 22 cores. Each of them is carrying about 100 terabits per second. And a very complex system, just to get an idea, if you were to submit to send a, well, let's say, more or less high speed, 10 megabits per second connection to each Brazilian, you would, uh, uh, you would do that with one single fiber and still have 15 million spare. So that's, that's um, how this has uh, uh, evolved. I mean, this has reached the numbers that are pretty much uh, the limit in terms of what a fiber can transmit. And uh, what I want to talk about is where, where do we go from here, right? So you have the systems that are huge rack, rack, uh, rack size um, systems, transmitting a lot of information, and what is the future of that? And so to understand the future, let's look at the past. This is an image of a data center from the 1940s, I think. Um, those are basically switching, right? So what those lasers are doing, they're, they're connecting signal from coming from one end, mechanically, like manually, right? Get the cable, connect the other cable. And then it's interesting to look at the back of those panels, and it's something like that. So you have this mass of spaghetti of cables, um, and this guy's trying to find the problem in the middle of them, right? But, but what is interesting is that you have so much, so much cable. And there are two reasons for that. One is the capillarity. You have to go to different places. But also, you have to multiply signal. There's a lot of information going on. And if you now go to the present, um, you have the data centers. And uh, those racks, basically, each, of, each box here is, is, is a computer, right? It's, um, it, it, it's doing the very basic function that uh, those, ladies, those ladies were doing before, which is switching. Uh, of course, a lot more. But the very basic function is still switching. And it's interesting now to look on the back of these panels again. And uh, it's not exactly the same one, but the one that I had the picture was in Barcelona. And it's colored image, right? But pretty much the same, right? You still have this massive amount of cables. And the difference being that now these cables are optical fibers, OK? So you still carry a lot of data, a lot of information. and uh, and um, uh, the technology has a lot more capacity, but also we use a lot more data. Right? We have the internet and all that, so on and so forth. And let's keep on going. So um, this is how these cables get into the equipment. Um, if you open them up and look inside, you'll see something like this. So these fibers get into this little box. Um, and this is, this is basically an array of lasers and photodetectors. And then this is converted to electrical, and then the, the information is um, connected backwards to the uh, to the microprocessor. Okay, so the the image that optics was used only for connecting I don't know one continent to another continent. It's 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 different now. It's now getting so close to the microprocessor that a lot of people over the last ten years or so 
are working in the next phase, which is to integrate the photonics over here into the electronics chip. Okay, so that's sort of the next um, um, phase on, on photonics. So get them on the chip. This is a view from IBM. It's been around for a few years. Um, the chips of the future would have um, layers that are electronic. So the transistors are still there to do the processing of information. And then on top of them, uh, photonic layer, meaning conversion from electronic to photonics. Uh, that signal is routed throughout the chip and then backward uh, from there. Um, This is a silicon waveguide. So what you see here is um, silicon material on a silicon oxide uh, substrate and then air around it. And the thing about silicon is that it is transparent at 1.1 micron. So it carries light. So if you calculate the distribution of light and the basic functionality, which is to send light from one point to another, can be done in a simple structure like that on the chip. Um, you can also manipulate electrons and change the properties of light, but we're not going to focus on that uh, right now. So what has already been done? And this is not really new. A lot of the basic functionalities have already been demonstrated. So if you think about what you have to do on that chip with the uh, light signals, so you have to route them, you have to perhaps separate different wavelengths, one would go to another a position, another to another position. Um, you have to couple them from and to the chip into optical fibers. Um, so once you have to modulate them. So uh, lots of uh, different functionalities that need to be done. And the structures that you see here do that. So for example, in this particular case, you have a waveguide coming in, and then you have this structure and a waveguide out. If you send wavelengths down here, uh, the wavelengths that are in resonance with the uh, out. You guys hear me? Okay. And this is this is wavelength selective, so this can be used to uh, select different wavelengths and route. Um, <clears throat> and so the point in this slide is that look at how precise we can make structures that control light, right? And um, the basic building blocks are there. What does that mean? Does that mean we're done? And I'd like to go back to this paper here um, that compare where photonics is with respect to electronics. Um, so this is, this is uh, sort of the dream when, when we're talking about photonic integration in uh, uh, the Bell Journal in 1969. This is a picture of a commercial chip from a company called Infinera. And you compare the number of devices per year. And of course, electronics, you have a lot done. And in photonics, you have a gap of uh, 10 to 7, right? Um, this is just to show that there is still a lot to do. Um, and why, why is that? Why is it that we have a lot to do? Um, in electronics, you have a very basic building block, which is a transistor. In photonics, that's not really all based on a single building block. You have all the different functionalities, and they all require different building blocks. As I mentioned, you need lasers. You need to emit light. You need photodetectors to convert back to electricity. You need to modulate light. You need to convert an electrical signal into the optical signal, um, multiplexers, attenuators, so on and so forth, so lots of functionalities. Um, materials. Electronics is based on silicon. The photonics, well, there are some problems, right? So for example, for lasers, we need um, act, uh, direct band gap material, which silicon is not. And, 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 and so um, some other reasons. So, um, but there are benefits, right? So for example, if I take that uh, system that was discrete, so you have all the components uh, that I show you the rack size of equipment, and you integrate them on a chip, you save a lot of space, energy, so on and so forth. So this is a comparison of a system, one that is discrete, and one that uses integrated chips. So you make them much smaller, more power efficient, so on and so forth. Okay? So, all right. Um, 
So just last year, uh, at the end of last year, IBM uh, released a, um, their um, uh, 100 gigabit silicon photonic transceiver. Um, I don't know whether this is much used in commercial really, but I think it's to show that the industry is also very interested in that, similar to Intel, and it's also uh, 2015. And so this is something that will, will, um, will, will have, um, has a lot of promise. Okay, so in this scenario, why photon phono interaction? Why we are interested on that? And I'm going to show a lot of um, examples now, going through the recent literature, of building blocks of things that we can do um, to create devices or to control light using its interaction with uh, phonons or acoustic waves. Okay. So that's the main general point. <clears throat> and why is that? Um, we're going to talk in detail about this. But you saw from Philip's talk already that when you send a light pulse or a, 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 a signal, a light signal, into a structure, is it an optical? could be an optical fiber, could be a waveguide, could be a cavity, could be a disc, it will generate elastic waves. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to remember. It's not an external source that goes there and modulate the material, makes it vibrate, so then you send light and it interacts. It, the light itself generates it, right? We're gonna get into this a little bit. At the same time, once you have this acoustic wave propagating into the material, it will perturb the optical properties. It will change the refractive index it will change the shape of the, the, the structure itself, right? So there is um, an interaction here. And with that interaction, you can build devices. Very well, so let's try to understand a little bit more. There are two basic mechanisms by which light can generate an acoustic vibration, as far as we understand. The, the, the first mechanism, Philip talked about it, and this is my illustration of it. Imagine you have, this is my photon, okay? And this is the material. Just think about uh, a mirror or, 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 or some, some dielectric material, for example. Uh, it goes infinite that size, infinite that size, and then this pulse is propagating this way right here. And so the electric field, let's think about it, it's that way on the paper or on the wall, and this is the direction in which it propagates. So when it reflects back, it transfers momentum into the material, right? So this is going to exert a force. And this wave that was created here is going to propagate. So you can think about this uh, on a structure that is confining light, where the walls are going to feel radiation, feel radiation pressure. So on a waveguide, you have the zigzag uh, uh, drawing from Philip uh, today, and think about every time it it, um, it bounces on the surface that will uh, push the surface or bring the first down. Make sense? Okay, but that's not the only mechanism. There's also another one, which is um, the electrostriction force. Let's now forget about the boundaries. Think about an infinite medium, okay? Uniform. And then we change the direction of propagation. It's now, the laser is propagating that way towards you. And let's just put the um, electric field in this direction right here. Um, and I wanna focus at this point. So this is where the field has a strong gradient. Right, so if there's nothing here, and then it rapidly goes up, and then maximum, and then goes down again. So this is the part where it's going up. That's where the gradient is. And so let's, oops, sorry, let's look into that. Let's zoom up. So here's my field. So it's zero there, and it's going up, and we already know what's going to happen. We talked a lot about this yesterday. So we're going to form a dipole. So, um, <clears throat> but. The point is, the center of mass of the positive charge and the negative charge coincides. 
right? It's, it's right there. The atom is right there. But as soon as, so the force is the same. So Q times E and minus Q times E that way. So the atom itself does not feel a net force, right? But we form the dipole, and now they are physically separated in space. Now this guy is in a position where the field is small, or smaller, and this guy in a position where the field is larger, right? So the force here is going to increase, and there it's going to decrease, something like that. So the net force, therefore, is no longer zero. Make sense? And then obviously what's going to happen is this thing is going to move. So this is the electric friction. It has nothing to do with a boundary, right? It's just a dipole interacting with the field. It's a dipole interaction. All right. And so we go back to our uh, macroscopic there. And when we send the light of pulse, that, that's what happens. So it, it, the, the atoms tend to go towards the gradient and, 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 and then a pulse like that. So you can now start to visualize what, how in the photonic crystal fiber that Philip showed, when you send light, it's going to excite waves that vibrate that way, right? Because of electric restriction. OK? OK, so, um, so then let's talk about brilliant scattering. Brilliant scattering is a process in which an incident photon uh, is scattered into uh, a scattered photon and uh, generates, for example, an, a, a, a phonon. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the um, spectrum of light, we send a laser uh, in at a certain frequency, and then we have a redshift um, signal at the frequency of the acoustic vibration. Right? At the same point, at the same time, you can have um, the absorption out of a phonon and then create a blue shift uh, signal. So a simple experiment would be you send light in, the sample is here, you look at the spectrum before and after interacted with the uh, acoustic waves, and you should see in addition to the uh, line that you send in, um, two side, one to the right, one to the left, at the frequency of the acoustic wave, right? Uh, in order for this process to be efficient, uh, we have to have energy conservation and momentum conservation. So in a waveguide, which is what I'm gonna be treating, um, the propagation is always along the axis. Right? So the uh, mode can either propagate in the forward direction or in the backward direction. So um, the conservation of momentum is also in this direction. So um, what needs to happen is that if I have backward scattering, so if I send light in and then it gets scattered in the backward direction, the change in momentum is twice the momentum of what it was. Right, so this is this is this has a certain uh, beta propagating, and then it's now propagating backwards. So I have beta minus minus beta, so two times the propagation constant is the change of the uh, optical uh, momentum, and that needs to be equal to the momentum of the acoustic phonon that was was created. So the phase matching condition that we talked before yesterday, in the backward. Scattering is the optical propagation constant needs to be twice in modulus the acoustic propagation constant. So we need to remember that. This is we're going to use this uh, in in the next slide. Okay. So in the backward case, the acoustic waves propagates. It's not stationary. It's not just vibrating the entire structure. It's propagating. Now, what about the um, forward scattering? If light is scattered in that direction, it comes in with a beta, and then it comes out almost with the same beta. The same direction, but slightly different frequency. Um, but again, Philip said that the frequency here, the frequency of the acoustic waves are gigahertz or less, and the frequency of the optical waves is like 200 terahertz. So the change is like very small. So it's the beta coming in and beta coming out is pretty much the same. So the difference is almost zero, right? That's the Raman-like type of process that Philip was mentioning before. And so for forward scattering, then the acoustic waves are at the cutoff point, meaning they do not propagate. They have beta almost zero. They're just transverse vibration, the entire 
structure is vibrating like that. It's not a wave that is propagating. Is it clear the difference? Yeah? Okay. Very well. <clears throat> so let's see some examples. So Philip showed this before, and uh, I want to start by discussing um, two, particular, two specific points. The first one, the structure that I'm talking about is the photonic crystal fiber. This fiber, as Philip mentioned, is made of glass and then air. The light fields are confined in here, and they, they propagate confining the quark. Now, the acoustic waves, surprisingly, they are also more or less confined in the quark. And what is very surprising is when you measure the spectrum of light that is backscattered, instead, instead of observing a single frequency like I mentioned before, you observe several frequencies, okay? So what this is telling us is there are discrete acoustic modes that are trapped in the core and are, they're also interacting with light. And the point to take here is, okay, so if we learn now how to confine both optical and acoustic waves in the same space, and then control their properties, the, the, the phase, the, the, the speed in which they propagate, their profile, the optical profile, or the acoustic profile, then perhaps we can, uh, we can manipulate the interaction. We can make them stronger, we can make them weaker, we can make them um, control the frequency specifically, so on and so forth, okay? And the modes, they have different characteristics, right? So this is sort of the breathing mode, Philip mentioned, and this is more like, um, uh, elliptical kind of mode, so it, 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 it does something like that. So it creates a birefringes that fluctuates in time, and this is modulate the phase uniformly. Okay, um, some other examples where this optical force thing is in, is 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 there. So this is this is uh, so you have the waveguide coming in here, and uh, the two. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there are two um, discs on top of each other. Right? with an air gap, here's like a zoom, an air gap, and they're so close that the modes are coupled, right? So the modes of the structure, you have the mode of one, the mode of the other, and when you, the, the coupled modes are the symmetric and anti-symmetric, meaning the optical field changes sign from one to the other. And if you send light in, what happens is there is also a gradient of field here. So if there is a gradient like the one I mentioned before, there will be a force, right? So for one mode, this force is positive, and for the other mode, it's negative. So you, change, you tune the optical power, and you make the disks come closer or separate them. So you see the functionality already. It's a way to change the coupling between two optical modes using the optical force, right? So this could be useful for a device. Here's another one. Two sets of disks. So one is right here, the other is right there. And they were ideally the same. So the frequency of the acoustic vibration would be the same. Due to manufacturing, they're not exactly the same. Some small differences, uh, you would have, you have two slightly different frequencies. So let's say the, you make the first one to have one frequency like uh, 50.1 uh, megahertz and the other one slightly different. And then when you send light in, because they are close, they're not touching mechanically. They're separated mechanically, but they are close. So light propagates in one and couples into the other. So the optical field is in both, okay? And the forces that the optical field make on the disks synchronize them. So you force them to oscillate on the same frequency, right? So another functionality, so synchronization. So if you increase the power, eventually, the two disks oscillate on the same frequency. Okay, um, there are many other examples. I'm gonna go kind of quickly, some of them. Uh, you can also use brilliant scattering to make slow or fast light. So control sort of how um, the, uh, the propagation time. So this is demonstrated in fiber, and uh, basically you have two pulses. The difference is only the power in which you send in 
and when the power was uh, higher, you have interaction with acoustic phonon, and that changes the speed of light. Um, you can also make an amplifier. So this is one uh, where you have a silicon wire, and then you have the acoustic vibration right here, and you're exploring forward brilliant scattering, so it's a transverse vibration. The optical mode is calculated there. And then uh, you can send two lasers in. One is very strong, the other is weak. And then, similar to what we talked about yesterday, but now mediated by the acoustic wave, you can transfer energy from the strong laser to the weak laser amplifier. Okay, so a narrow bandwidth amplifier. Um, so it's another functionality that, that can be done. Um, you can also generate very um, narrow line with microwave um, signals by controlling um, the frequency. So this is, this is a disk, relative, oh, the scale is not here, but relatively large. Um, and then by interacting with the acoustic vibration on the disk, you create a signal, and with a feedback loop, you, feedback loop, you make this very narrow line. So I'm going to kind of go um, quickly now just on the, the functionality. Um, you can do an isolator, meaning you send light in, and depending on the optical power, the light propagates or gets reflected backwards. So this is like an optical fuse type of device. Um, Philip mentioned, well, he didn't mention that. It was the last part of his talk. Uh, but generating uh, frequency comb using those uh, interaction and also some uh, more fundamental studies uh, where you could now observe phonons and therefore take energy from the system to cool down. Okay, so those are examples. I hope I have convinced you that you can use interaction to try to create functionalities, to try to create devices, right? And more, moreover, um, the ability to fabricate those complex structures, being a disk, being a, a waveguide, or, or, or all that, um, we, we now can confine the laser and the acoustic phonons in the same volume and control the interaction. And so the work that I'm going to show is, is a result of that, but completely sort of counterintuitive. And, and this, is, this is what I, I want to, to, to focus on. So we expect, we expect strong photophono interaction when a few things happen. The first one, as I mentioned, both elastic and optical waves are confined in the same space and overlapping, all right? We have energy and momentum conservation. So we have the phase matching, the frequencies match, et cetera. And the coupling mechanisms, the forces or the change in the refractive index, either through the body effect or the surface effect, are individually strong. So let's just check the box here. Are they overlap? Are they are the acoustics in the same volume? Yes, they are. Right? They have strong overlap very well. So I expect that they will interact. We do have energy momentum conservation fully satisfied, so the phase matching condition. And finally, we have the coupling mechanisms. The surprising thing is that we can play with the coupling mechanisms in a way that they are opposite to each other. The surface and the body effect are opposite. And if we can control them quite precisely, they can have the same magnitude and one can support the other. Okay? So that's what I'm going to discuss in detail. And therefore, all light scattering is suppressed. You, you, you won't see any scatter, despite uh, you expect all of that. So let's try to understand how that, um, how that works. First of all, let's talk about the samples. What is it that we use? We use um, fiber tapers to do this experiment. Um, and they are manufactured like that. So you start with an optical fiber. And then with a micro burner, you bring it closer, okay, a flame. Then this part of the fiber is going to be soft, right? You're going to increase the temperature. And then you pull the fiber to the sides. So when you start pulling, think about this. This is going to narrow down and then eventually get to a structure like that. Um, you can control this particular shape by controlling 
um, the flame, the size of the flame and how it moves uh, during the process in which you pull. And what you can get is, is a structure more or less like that, where you have the single mode fiber input, then you have a transition region in which the diameter rapidly decreases, and then it gets to a section where the diameter is fairly uniform, okay? Fairly uniform. It's not uh, continuously decreasing to the center and then go back up. You have the transition region that does decrease, and then it's another optical fiber the diameter that is much less than what it was before. So uh, we can go from 125 microns, for example, to anything, um, I don't know, 30 microns, 10 microns, 20, uh, 5, 1, and, and even less. So, for example, in our particular case, we make those silica wires from about 500 nanometers to 1.5 microns or so. So the diameter of the uniform region is, is what I'm mentioning. It's from about 500 to 1.5 microns. Its length is also controlled. For our particular work, we did something like 80 millimeter. Okay, so think about this. It's, it's a little wire that has half a micro in diameter and 80, like this, 80 millimeter long uh, suspended in air. There's nothing around. And uh, what is really cool is that you, you, at the end, it's just single mode fiber, right? So we can do the experiment sending light with the fiber in, measuring what comes out or measuring what's reflected, uh, and then measuring the interaction right here, okay? So that's the sample that we used, and I uh, just wanted to get this number. So we get a huge reduction from 125 to about 400 nanometer, and we can make them quite uniform. So we also have uh, a way to characterize that. So how uniform is this? Is this really 500 nanometer, or is it 6, 5, 8? It, it's fairly uniform. It varies less than, than 10, 20 nanometers, and uh, over a very long length, about 80 millimeters. All right. Um, so let's look what happens then. So Philip showed this before. If you calculate the mode, and yesterday we talked about this in a regular optical fiber, the mode is confined in the center, in the core of the fiber. So any effect on the surface has pretty much no impact on the mode that is propagated through the fiber. So remember before, we had the body effect and then the surface effect. In conventional fibers, there should be no effect at all because it's not overlapping. The optical field is zero here already. Now, when we, uh, when we reduce the diameter, we already know what's going to happen to the field. So you remember the chart from Philip. The field is going to expand, expand, expand. Eventually, it's even bigger than the wire itself, right? So the surface is now overlapping quite strongly with the, uh, the, uh, the nanowire. Okay, so uh, let's skip this here. And uh, this is the um, calculation of the mode profile. Uh, those wires are single mode, so they carry only one particular mode, two polarizations, but this particular mode is polarized this way, right here. And uh, this, the color scale represents the pointing vector, so the intensity of light. And uh, it's right here, so the red is the strongest, and then it, 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 it is it is, it is, um, they go through in air, right? So this is air and this is the, 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 the glass part. So now, yes, if I have a shift of the frequency, then um, there is light where that perturbation is and it, it will have an impact on the interaction, okay? Make sense? Any questions so far? Yeah. How uniform? So um, about 1%, 2% uniformity on the diameter. So it's 500 nanometers, plus or minus 5 or 10. You're talking about the heat, right? Yeah, so um, think about this. So the core, initially, it was about 10 microns, and then 125 is the cladi, right? When you narrow down this from 125 to 400, 125 microns to 400 nanometers, there's pretty much no core anymore. 
the core becomes the glass and the cladding is the air around it. Okay? So that's what, what guides light now is, is the, uh, the 1.5 refractive index of glass and 1.0 refractive index of air. Okay? Any more questions? Okay. All right, so we have our first, um, our first point there. We, we, if we have a confined structure, then the, the, the surface should matter. Something should uh, impact the interaction with phonons. Okay, now let's look at how these, these wires vibrate. Um, and Philip mentioned some of the uh, modes, but this is an illustration of two families of acoustic modes. Um, the first one is called the axial radial mode, which I'm just uh, 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 using R uh, as, a, as, as a, a legend for it. So R01, so the axial radial acoustic mode. And it has only acoustic displacement in the radial direction, uniformly, and in the axial direction. So at the same time, it expands like that, transversely, it compresses like that. Right, so you can see that over here. The other family is torsional radial uh, modes. This family has not only the radial component in the axle, but it also has azimuthal um, component. So you can see that at the same time it expands out, but it also deforms azimuthally. So the, 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 the shape transversely also changes. So in this particular case, it changes in sort of elliptical form, right? So it expands out over here and then compresses out, compresses in this, in this direction here. Um, and obviously, you can now start to imagine that they are going to perturb the refractive index in different ways, right? So if this is uniform, if it expands out, every point in the transverse direction now has sort of a lower density, right? You can think of that as, a, as the strain is sort of positive. So the, the density decreased. And in glass, when, when the density decreases, the refractive index goes down. So the photoelastic coefficient is positive. We'll get into that. In this case, it's kind of hard to see because it, it expands up and compresses over here. So you will have some sort of spatial average of what the, the refractive index perturbation is. Now, on the surface effect, my cell phone? No. I'm, no, I don't have my cell phone here. Um, OK, so, so yeah, so the perturbation throughout the body is different in this mode than in this mode. But also on the surface, right? You can see in this particular case, the dashed line since it expands uniformly radially, the perturbation is also uniform on the boundary of the material. On the other hand, this you change the shape, right? So um, that's, we, we need to take that into account now. So each mode, each acoustic <laughs> mode, will perturb the refractive index in a different way, right? So uh, that's something to, to remember as well. The other thing that's quite interesting is if you get the fundamental mode in each family. So you see this is, I call this R01. We'll see in the next few slides uh, the other modes, R02, R03, R04, etc. And the same, the same thing here, TR21. So for each family, the fundamental mode is very interesting because it has the following property. <clears throat> As the frequency gets very high, the acoustic vibration becomes concentrated on the surface. Okay, so it's like more and more the body is sort of not vibrating much, but then the surface vibrates a lot. So they become what's called Rayleigh waves. They become surface waves. They, they, they make the surface vibrate more than, than, uh, than, than the body. More or less the acoustic energy gets concentrated into the, uh, into the surface. So if you think about it, if I want to explore the interplay between an effect in the body and an effect on the surface, 
these are the modes that would be the best candidates because they do make the surface vibrate more, okay? So that's, that's um, also a, a particular characteristic that make this, this uh, structure interesting. All right, so when we calculate the dispersion relation, so um, we solve the eigenmodes of the acoustic uh, structures. This is a simple, uh, analyt uh, simple geometry, so there's all analytical solutions. And you can plot here the propagation constant of the acoustic wave. So um, this, the acoustic waves propagated with a certain propagation constant. So this is what I'm plotting here as a function of frequency, right? So that's the dispersion relation. Philip showed you sort of inverted, right? The frequency going up uh, in the vertical axis and then beta over here. Um, and this line, what it shows is the phase matching condition. So this is the number that the acoustic of uh, wave vector needs to be in order for phase matching to occur, okay? Each line uh, represents a different mode family. So the blue line represents the axial radial modes and the red line the torsional radial modes. This is what I mentioned, the R01, this is R02, this is R03. And the number one, two, three has to do with nodes, uh, sort of how much it varies transversely, right? Um, and so what do you see here? You see that the point where it crosses is where the phase matching occurs. Therefore, you project it, and this is the frequency that you should see interacting with light more strongly, right? So if I send light into this structure, I should see one peak over here, so 4, 5, 5.9, something like that. Another peak over here, 6 point something, 8, so on and so forth. Okay, so the, the, the discrete peaks that I mentioned in photonic crystal fiber there is very similar here. The acoustic modes are discrete. And so only the frequency at which there is phase matching, I will see um, the interaction. I will see a, 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 a peak in the spectrum. And so let's just count. So uh, I don't know, up to about 12 gigahertz, I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I should say six uh, peaks eventually. Okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> now, we need to talk a little bit more about these perturbation mechanisms and how they cause a change in refractive index. So this is an illustration where I have the original boundary in solid line and the field that was calculated, the mode that was calculated. Then you have sort of the dashed lines. I'm not sure how much you guys can see the dashed lines. Um, illustrating the fundamental R01 mode, right? And, um, all right, so what, what do you see here? You see in the body of the material, the dashed lines are approaching each other and then uh, getting further away from each other, right? So you have compression, compression, and then an expansion of the material, right? So uh, throughout the body, you will have uh, a perturbation of the index due to an effect that's called the photoelastic effect. Let's recap from the class yesterday. Remember our very simple model in which you have the parabolic potential and the electronic cloud there. If you compress the material, you can see that the atoms get closer to each other, right? So the potential will change. Remember that? And remember that the refractive index has its origin exactly on that, on the linear restoring force. So if I'm changing the potential, I'm changing the linear refractive index, right? Okay, so this is the photoelastic effect. So I'm gonna write again, like we did yesterday, the displacement as um, epsilon zero E plus a nonlinear polarization. And this nonlinear polarization is simply a change in the susceptibility, a change in the refractive index, right? And the photoelastic effect um, is a tensorial effect, meaning uh, it's characterized by a constant, the photoelastic tensor, and the strain 
in the material. Try to generalize this simple model we had yesterday to 3D, right? So if you compress the material in one direction, depending on the symmetry of the material, you can have a change on the index on the other direction as well. So this is what this uh, expression represents. Strain is not the acoustic displacement, but it is the compression, right? It's how the displacement changed from one point to the other. So if I have strain throughout the body, um, then I, I, I can have this uh, anisotropic perturbation. And, and that's, that's, that, it, that complicates more or less how we understand um, the process, but we will, we will look into this in detail. And then we go back to our overlap integral that we had before, the very same equation where we have E dot P, and P is now delta epsilon E. Okay, so this is the overlap integral we had yesterday that we derived uh, using Maxwell equations. And uh, this is what I need to calculate. I need to, look, I have the acoustic mode. Now I need to know how it deforms, so I calculate the strains, and then integrate the overlap between the field that scattered, the field that uh, came in, and the perturbation. I know this is hard to see because, you know, this is a tensor and then the overlap integral, but we'll, we'll get into this. But the point to remember here is that this effect uh, depends on the body strain and it happens throughout the entire uh, body of the material. Well, it has nothing to do with the surface, right? It's simply strain, how much deformation you have there. So we also have to talk about what happens here on the boundary. And that's, those are two, oops, sorry, let me go back here. There are two, um, um, two papers that I recommend you take a look um, that has, um, that they have um, very well um, um, put that into um, mathematical terms, but we're gonna do something simple here to understand. Um, let's look at the field distribution, this particular case. What's the polarization of the field here? Horizontal, right? Why is that? Well, it's clearly continuous over here, so the tangential field, electric field is continuous, so, so it not needs to point that way. And over here, it is discontinued, right? So you see it, it goes down and then goes back up very quickly, so something like this. When you get to the boundary, and then it goes like that. All right. So um, if I shift the boundary, the discontinuity needs to shift as well to satisfy Maxwell equations, right? But over here, the field is the same to one side and to the other side. So if I make the shift infinitesimally small, then the perturbation should go to zero here as well, right? Um, over here, it doesn't matter how small it is because it's discontinuous. There's also there's always a perturbation. Do you see that? So the way to um, to um, characterize that is is is, is an expression where you, you you do exactly that. So you decompose your field into a parallel and a normal component. Um, the parallel, we know the electric field is continuous. So we can write the electric field before and after the perturbation as a component that is tangential, and I know it's the same, therefore it's not going to change much. And then another component that uh, instead of using the electric field, you use the normal displacement field, because that is uniform. And, and then uh, when you subtract it to other, you get a perturbation on the electric field, the normal electric field, uh, which is given by the difference between the, the electrical uh, permeability. Okay? And we can do the same for, um, for the displacement field. But now it inverts because the normal component is uniform, and then um, it's the tangential one that changes. And in the end, um, you put that back into the coupling, the overlap integral that we had before, and you end up with a uh, expression that is like that. So the first term is here, the second term is there, and the integral is over this small area right here because the perturbation only happens in this area. And so since this is small, 
the area integral becomes a line integral. Okay? So we go back to uh, our, our, um, our, um, our um, schematic. And uh, in the end of the day, I have the two effects. Uh, one that needs to take into account the overlap integral through the air of the electric fields and the perturbation due to photoelastic effect. And another that needs to uh, is characterized by a, a line integral between the perturbation and then the acoustic displacement. All right? So what do we have to do now? We have to calculate those. We have to compute. So I know what's the optical profile. It's right here. Now, I take the acoustic profile, we'll calculate that through the strain, we'll calculate the shape deformation, the normal acoustic displacement, and the two integrals. So this is a first uh, order perturbation theory well, in which I average out the perturbation throughout the area. So if a certain mode causes a positive perturbation in one location and a negative on the other location, the area integral sort of uh, averages out, so one cancels out. The same thing over here, if I shift out or if I shift in, there will be some kind of a linear um, um, averaging throughout the boundary, okay? All right, so, uh, <clears throat> but let's simplify. All those tensorial products, it becomes quite complicated. Let's look at a simple picture here and do what we call sort of a toy model. It's too hard to do those overlap integrals and see what, easy to do numerically, but hard to understand. So let's understand a simple case first. Let's ignore any perturbation, but just think about an expansion radially. Forget about the axial compression, forget about azimuthal um, twisting. Let's just get a very simple case where the wire just goes into that direction. And here is our electric field where the discontinuity is there, the maximum is here, there is a certain value of the field on the surface relative to the, um, to the center, which we can control. Um, and then let's see what happens when you expand. Well, we're going to do a very simple, we're going to calculate a very simple parameter here, eta, and I call this moving boundary. So first, sort of a a parameter that characterizes how strong is this effect. And I'm going to say this is going to be a product between the actual change in the index and the area in which that perturbation happens. So the actual change in the index, that's easy. It was air, and now it's glass. So it's 1.5 minus 1. So this is 0 0.5. There you go. The change in index is huge. Okay, It's very large because you go from glass to air. But it only happens in a very small area. Which area is that? Well, it's also very simple, right? It's the displacement multiplied by the perimeter. Right there. OK. And then the other one. Oops. Well, the other one. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, again, delta n times area. Well, the area is now very large because it's the entire. So the area is, is easy. It's uh, uh, pi times r squared. This is d. So there is a one fourth, but cancels out another one there. So, so that's the area right there. And then delta n. Now, delta n is uh, the approximation here that we did. So. I mentioned it's, it's a tensor product, right? But if the only displacement that I have is the radial displacement, then the only strain that I have is the radial strain, which is the derivative of ur over r. So the only parameter that I have is srr, which is the ur dr. So how much am I compressing or expanding in the radial direction? And this is given by the photoelastic coefficient. So that is the expression that you can calculate. And by the way, we just assume that this strain is linear, meaning if I plot over here how much is ur versus r, I did something like that, linear. 
So u r is the value on the boundary times r divided by d, d over 2. So it's linear. It expands out linearly. So it all becomes simple. And I can calculate again as a function of how much the surface displacement. So the first one depends on how the surface uh, changed. And now the second one also depends only on the surface. OK? And note, see that if the photoelastic coefficient is positive, then the perturbation is negative, which is true for glass. Um, so let's look at the ratio between them. And you get something like this. You divide, you, I want to compare the two effects. And you see it becomes, for this simple uh, structure here, independent on the diameter of the wire. It cancels out. And what we see, obviously, they have different sign, as I mentioned before. But more or less in the same order of magnitude. It's not that one is like 10 to 4 the other, right? It's about uh, five times. And so that tells us, that's a simple estimate, that tells us the photoelastic effect and the moving boundary effect are indeed comparable. You cannot ignore them in this particular system, right? Now, we left out one important problem in this simple, in this, in one important consideration. In this simple calculation here, we have completely ignored the field profile, right? I mean, we, uh, there's nothing here about where the field is. I mean, if there is no field on the boundary, for example, that tells nothing. But that goes into the uh, overlap integral. When we do the overlap integral, this is going to be taken into account. Okay? Um, and so how much this part is going to contribute versus how much that part is going to contribute needs to be sort of weighted by how much field I have here versus how much field I have in the center. All right. Um, and we can control that by simply changing the wire diameter. It's the drawing that Philip showed before. If I plot in, uh, in red, this is the field on the surface, so this number right here, divided by the field in the center. OK? And as a function of the diameter of the wire. And so that increases monotonically. So if I want to give more weight to the boundary effect, I need to go in that direction. If I want to give more weight to the body effect, then I need to go in this direction. Make sense? So what, if I want to find a point in which they exactly balance out, I can scan this diameter and see if there is a point where I give the right weighting. So that, that point 0.2 factor becomes 1. OK? And then the spatial average is 0. That's all there is. All right? So um, <clears throat> let's, um, let's calculate now exactly those uh, coupling coefficients. So the toy model, we leave them there. And now we seriously get the right profiles for optical mode, for the acoustic mode, plug into that equation, and see what we get. And we did that for all the modes, right? So once again, I have the dispersion relation. The uh, radio, the R01 mode is, is this one. That's the one that I was using the toy model to represent, the symmetric fundamental mode. But we also have the other modes and the TR modes, etc. cetera. Um, and here's what we see. In green, I don't have the legend here. In green, I have the uh, photoelastic effect. And then in... Uh, um, red, brown, I don't know, we have the mode effect. And you can see that depending on the mode profile, they can actually be, have the same sign or be opposite to each other, right? The, 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 the toy model assumes this one here. It's uniform. But it depends on the way the acoustic mode changes the shape and the way it changes uh, the strain in the body of the material. So each mode has sort of a different... Uh, different uh, uh, profile here. And so these guys are in the same direction. So there's never going to be cancellation in this one, for example. They act in the same direction, right? And then the, the, the black is a total. But for this, yes, there is a cancellation. And uh, can, there could be a cancellation. Now, notice that for this particular diameter, and I believe this is 
one micron. Um, one effect, this is log is key. No, this is not one micron. What is this? Omar must know. OK. Uh, so you see that this is much bigger than that. So the result, this is log scale. The result is, is, um, is that that dominates. So although they are opposite, they're not canceled here. So that diameter doesn't work. I, I will still see, will sti will, I will sti still see scattering. So let's calculate it as a function of diameter for the two fundamental modes again. So I get the, the first two points and I calculate again and I had inverted the colors before, sorry. Um, this is the exact same coefficient as a function of the uh, wire diameter. And what you see is that, uh, the moving boundary effect is always positive for the axial radio. And then the uh, photoelastic effect has sort of an interesting behavior here. It starts out as negative and then it goes back up. There is a zero point. We're going to talk about this. And then it gets positive here. But there is a point at 1.1 micron where that weighting factor that the field can, brings in um, exactly cancel out. So if I make samples that I vary the diameter, like I mentioned before, and measure the scattering, I should see this point, a reduction in the scattering. So I should see zero right here. Scatters uh, efficiently there, uh, but then gets to zero and then scatter, scatters light again. Okay? Um, on the other hand, for the TR family, that doesn't happen. If you look at the moving boundary effect, it's much smaller than the moving boundary. Look at the scale here. This goes from 0 to 8 versus that, uh, I don't know, from minus 0.5 to about to 1. And it's kind of simple to understand as well, right? Because the moving boundary effect, remember, it's, it's a line integral. I'm averaging what's happening throughout the, the, the shape of the material. And then over here, while it's positive, the perturbation here, it was air, now it's glass. Over here, it's the opposite. So this is going to cancel that, more or less. And so the moving boundary effect, if I have a, a mode that does this kind of uh, deformation, is going to be more or less small. All right? And so there's never going to be a cancellation for this mode, which is good for us in the experiment, because this is our reference. We will always see a peak that comes from this mode. OK, so. Um, all right, so in order to see the cancellation, that's what should happen, right? We need to have field on the surface. We need to have surface vibration. If the surface is there, but the acoustic profile does not make it move, then it doesn't matter. And then the two competing mechanisms. So you, have, you need to have the average photoelastic and the average uh, moving boundary opposite signs, and then tune their contributions by, by the field. This is, uh, if that all happens, we should not see scattering. Again. Notice that phase matching is satisfied. They're both overlapping, so on. But there should be not. Uh, each individual mechanism is, is strong, but then they, they will cancel out. This is a setup of the experiment. So for those that are going to take the course, that's what you're going to build. And uh, um, not getting detail, but the, uh, a simple schematic is here. Um, so you send a laser in, you amplify. You have a circulator that's going to collect whatever light is reflected back or is scattered back by the brilliant effect. And then we, we collect that on the port number three. And then there is a, a detection system here uh, that you will, you will implement using heterodyne detection. Um, and then here's our sample. And we just measure how much power goes out. And what you should see is this. So here's a pump laser. And this is the frequency detuning from, um, from the laser. And then you get a uh, um, signal like that. <clears throat> so uh, noise, and then two peaks here. And they're colored in blue and red, in which the blue one is the radio mode, and then the red one is the torsional radio mode. Okay? How do I know that? By the frequency. So I, got, uh, I look at the frequency, look at the phase matching. I know this is the radio mode, and this is the TR mode. And they are there. They're present, right? They're not canceled out. But this is 1.34 micron diameter. So this is the region between 5 and 7 uh, gigahertz that, uh, that, have, that, that has the, the, the two fundamental modes. But remember what I mentioned in the very beginning. We have several modes. And so if we look at the whole span, there should be all the other modes there. And in fact, they are there. I'm just focusing on the, the, the two modes that matter. But just to uh, 
um, to um, show the whole spectrum. So you have an idea. This is what we had before on the single mode that I mentioned, a single pick. And on the samples, you have this structure right there. Before I was just showing this, and now I'm showing the whole frequency um, up to about 12, um, 12 uh, gigahertz. Remember how many peaks I said we should have? About six in theory, right? And we have more. We have one, two, three, four, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, so there's something else going on here. And um, it's actually not hard to understand. Um, remember, again, our sample has single mode fiber at the input. So I should see something that comes from the single mode fiber as well. Then we have this transition region where the diameter is rapidly changing. And then we have the uniform wire. OK, so what I was talking about was scanning only by the wire itself, which if we calculate, these, they are the blue curves right here. So these are the big two. This is the TR21, the R01, R02, so on and so forth. OK? The red curve is calculating what's the scattering for each individual diameter here. So as the diameter change, these frequencies change, and then they, they accumulate over, over, over the transition region. So that's why you see like a bend and not a sharp peak. Each frequency here corresponds to a specific diameter. And then as I shift the diameter, they sort of go and shift around. And the efficiency changes a little bit. So you see sort of a bend on the, on the scanning. So if I add that plus that, um, what comes in, what is scattered from the wire and what is scattered from the transition region, then we had pretty much uh, the agreement with the, uh, the experiment. Um, so now we know that this band here comes from the transition region. This peak, this peak, this peak, they come from the wire itself. And um, so we, we understand the whole problem, and we're going to focus now on the two peaks that we explored before, but for, in which uh, the R01 mode should, um, should see the, uh, the self-cancellation effect. So. Um, Let's go to the uh, next slide. So uh, this is now, again, focusing on the 5 to 7 um, gigahertz frequency. And over here, we have the diameter from 0.4 to 1.6 microns. And the density plot here is simply the intensity of the scattered light in log scale as I change the diameter. And there's a couple of things, right? There are two curves. One curve is for the R01, the other is for the TR. The TR01, we see that it's, it gets stronger. They, there's sort of a frequency behavior here where it goes, as I change the diameter, it goes to smaller frequency, and then it goes back up to larger frequency. And they cross accidentally at somewhere around 0.8, uh, close to 0.9. On the other hand, the R01 mode has a similar frequency behavior. Um, but then a point over here, it goes to zero, right? So that's exactly where the, the cancellation is. So we made a bunch of samples um, trying to get these diameters right. And you can see the change in diameter here is very small. So we have to tune it very finely to get the samples distributed. And, and what you see is, is really that. So if you look at the red curve uh, that represents the TR mode, it is weak, like it should be here. It's darker over there. It, it follows a certain profile right there. There is an accidental crossing there, and then it, it goes back up. So it inverts, right? So the blue was short, uh, lower frequency. The red was higher over here. They are inverted. So the TR is my uh, reference. It never goes to zero, as I mentioned. On the other hand, the R01 mode is present over here, but it's amplitude reduced, and multiply by 15 here so we can see. Reduced again, cross, and then it goes back up, and now it's stronger than the TR mode, right? So that's, um, we can, um, we can um, just to better see the, 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 um, the effect, we can plot the ratio between how much power I have in DR versus how much power I have in the TR. And this is the number right there and uh, for all the samples. And then the, the uh, solid curve is the... Uh, 
the theory. The dashed curve is the zero, and uh, very well we get a pretty good agreement in demonstrating the, um, the effect. Um, just to confirm, we can also measure the frequency of of these modes to make sure that they really represent the modes that we're talking about. So we get the peak frequency and then compare with the theory and there's also pretty good agreement. So we know very well these modes are what they are. Okay, now there's one, uh, one last point to, uh, to make uh, in this experiment and it's to look at that particular sample right there. And there's one uh, quite uh, interesting aspect about it. Um, you see that the R peak is not very strong, um, much stronger than NTR. And this diameter, 0 0.51, is a very special diameter. If we go back to the curve that we had, comparing the amplitudes of the two effects, the zero was here at 1.1, where we predicted, but also at 0.50 something, okay? Um, then the photoelastic effect is zero. Uh, so the, 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 the strain, the perturbation, in the, 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 the strain perturbation in the body, uh, it, 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 um, it's not that there is no body strain. There is, right? But in parts of the core, it's positive. In other parts, it's negative. And the spatial average is zero. So there is no photoelastic effect in this diameter. And the scattering that we see is, um, is all due to... Um, to the moving boundary effect. So that's a sample that accidentally, we got it pretty close to the point where there is, there is uh, scattering only due to the moving boundary, okay? So this is, this is like in complete opposition to what we see in optical fiber. So in regular optical fiber, there is no moving boundary effect. All the scattering is due to photoelastic and this is sort of inverted, it's kind of cool. Um, to understand a little bit why the photoelastic effect is zero, is, is um, not, uh, not straightforward. But we can take a look. Um, this, is, this is the um, deformation, like the uh, schematic of the dashed line is the undeformed, and then the solid line is, is the, uh, uh, the deformation due to the acoustic wave. And on the, in the transverse plane right here, you see the center is, this is UR, and then you see the longitudinal displacement. And at the center, you are, you can see it does something like that. It, it increases quite linearly, pretty close to our approximation there. But then over here, it sort of has a zero slope and a negative slope. So the strain here is I'm, I'm expanding the material here, here I'm doing nothing, and here I'm compressing. On the other hand, the longitudinal, it's uniform, negative, uh, while this is positive, this is negative, so it expands out like that, compressed like that. And then it also changes sign, right? And, uh, okay, so we have this profile here that we need to link to that equation, that overlap equation. And there's several kind of mathematical steps, so we're going to kind of go uh, more intuitively. This is tensorial, but I only have, as I mentioned, U, R, and U, Z. You go back, you calculate, the integrand here has basically four terms. Um, <clears throat> one depends only on the transverse field, the mode ER and E phi, okay, E phi. And then the other term is, depends only on the longitudinal mode. So this, this is a mode, meaning the, the, uh, the electric field is not transverse, it has a longitudinal component. And then another term that is crossed. Right? But still, okay, so I have the optical profile there, but each of these terms, remember it's tensorial, so it gets messy. For example, this one here, how is it related to strain? Well, it's related to strain like that. You have uh, a constant, which is positive and, and negative here, and then P11 is the last photoelastic coefficient, P12 as well, and then they strain the radial direction, phi direction, and as in longitudinal direction. It's complicated, but not so much, because these guys are all positive. P11, P12, and P12. They're positive numbers. And they're about the same magnitude. And so what I have to see is, 
throughout the body, if the strain is always positive, then, then this guy is going to be always negative. However, if the strain components change sign in the area, then eventually they're going to change sign. Okay, so instead of looking at each term, and, and then let's just see what this looks like, this, this sum. Um, so here's the strain. And in fact, you see them crossing, right? Like I mentioned before, because there is in some part uh, compression, the other part expansion in the profile. So they do cross zero. And moreover, uh, you can see that over here, look at how interesting this is. While it expands in R, it compresses in Z, like we expected. But on the border, it inverts. You see, it expands in R, but then it expands again also in Z. So this sort of dynamics here will give the result of that. And, um, and it's something like this. So this is all modal calculation now. I know the optical mode. I know the acoustic mode. I can calculate what is this distribution in area for the transverse, for the longitudinal, for the cross. And they are all here. For the transverse is there, cross, and longitudinal. And my scale is arbitrary from minus 1 to 1. What do you see? You see. And this is the total. So you see that these two terms over here pretty much cancel out each other. And in the end, all you have is that, which is those two are pretty much close to each other. And you see what I talked about. So it is positive in the center and negative in the outer region. So by tuning a little bit the fields, I can make this area equal to that area. And that happens exactly at 0.51 micro. So therefore, the average integral here, it doesn't matter the acoustic wave is there. It is perturbing, but uh, the profile uh, averages out as a, on a first order. OK? So all right, this is all I had. Uh, we have about half hour now. Let me stop here. Any question on the brilliant, what's it? curiosity, whatever? Uh, yeah? Say it again? Um, one mode converting into another mode. Yeah. Um, let's go there. Oops. The dispersion relation for acoustic modes is complicated because in bulk material, if you think about a medium like no boundary, right, just plain acoustic waves, you have two kinds of waves. One that is what's called longitudinal waves in which the displacement is in the same direction in which the acoustic wave propagates, okay? And that has a dispersion relation that is linear in, 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 in bulk, and it has a speed that is higher than the other family, which is the transverse. All right, so you have, you would have one line that's about that line. This would be for the transverse wave, and another line which is right here, about about that. If I have, to, if I had to draw, it would be right here. Okay, Do, those would be the two fundamental waves in bulk. When you have a surface one kind of wave is converted into another kind of wave. So if I have a surface and I send in a longitudinal wave, at the reflection point, the surface vibrates, and what you see coming out is a transverse as well as a longitudinal. So the boundary of the waveguide couples them. And you form structures like that, where you may say that this is maybe an anti-crossing of these two fundamental waves. So that's sort of the origin of where, where you get those strange uh, dispersion relations. Yeah. Um, for glass, it's well known. Uh, it's being measured, characterized uh, before, so we just use the numbers that are available in the literature. And they, they can be measured. Right? You, you, you can be measured because it's just how much the index changed by compression. Yeah? Uh, this is 1.5 micron, yeah, 1.55. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like when you go to this moving boundary mode, only 
Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so the uh, honest answer is that we don't know. Um, I, I think it's um, simply it could be dumpy. So, but I would suspect if I have to bet, um, I wouldn't bet. I just <laughs> guess that this is more diameter variability. So, it's such a small sample, of 500 nanometers. Um, if, if, if the diameter varies a little bit, that frequency, frequency will, will shift, and we, we've seen that. I mean, we, we've seen that the diameter is, is, depending on the sample, is more uniform and not. Um, so I don't know, really. Um, something to look into. Yeah? I have a question about the measurement. Um, how much power are you using in? Yeah, not much. Uh, in the hundreds of milliwatts, so, yeah. Heterodyne, but there is a detail on the experiment. Where is the? Right there. So the detail is this. Where is my local oscillator here? It's not shown. I'm not showing my local oscillator. So, so I have um, the laser that I sent, the reference, the pump laser, is going in this direction. It's not coming here. At least it should not be coming here. Um, and then the signal that's backscattered is in this direction. So if I just put a photodiode like I have here, I should see just power, just a DC level, nothing. But what happens is that there is a little bit of the pump that uh, gets into this arm. A little bit from the extinction ratio of the circulator itself, in this case it's like 45 dBs. And since this signal is, is quite small, the backscattered signal, then they are comparable and it serves as an oscillator. But also there is a little bit of reflection on the sample itself. The transition region, I don't know if it's not exactly adiabatic or if it's at the end, but there's something that comes back linear reflection at the frequency of the pump. And therefore I already have my, my local oscillator here. So initially we did have a local oscillator there, but in the end it, does, it, it works that way as well. And, um, and so at the photodiode you have now beating between the two and that uh, is detected and put in an electrical uh, spectrum analyzer. And is the, um, so the magnitude of the, of the gluon or the, the yeah. acoustical back wave yeah. or backscattering is kind of on the order of part of 10 to the... Yes, four. it's, so it's is small. So you milliwatts in and maybe... Minus 30, minus 40. Okay, so 10 BBM. minus watts. And, and, and again, it, because it's, it's, it's just a waveguide, it's a one-pass yeah. thing, right? So it's, uh, it's weak. Yeah. Yeah. And you also looked in the forward direction? Yeah, we did. We, did. Uh, we calculated as well, and it happens. There is also a cancellation in the forward. We never reported or never did, but we, yeah, the calculations show there's also a zero. Now, different diameter, though. And it's interesting because... Um, If you look at this expression, you may ask, why is it? Um, so this is the overlap between the modes, right? The uh, mode that goes forward and the mode that goes backward. And what happens is the mode, when it goes backward, the Z field inverts sine. And so this is negative. But if you're looking the forward, then this becomes positive because it's the same mode profile. The Z field continues in the same direction. And so um, it changes the magnitude of K of the photoelastic. And so in order to get zero, the moving boundary needs to be a little bit bigger. So it goes to another diameter. But yeah, there is also the self-cancellation there. And we call, why, do, why is it self-cancellation? Because it's, it's the same acoustic modes that cause both perturbations, right? But they cancel each other. Okay. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Is there any requirement Yes. Yes. That's a good question. I am showing here about how many samples? One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten samples. And how but would if you measure the diameter, diameter, yeah. The yep, we'll get there. So, so this is all right, ten samples. But in our internal nomenclature, this is like T ninety one. This is like T seventy four, whatever. Meaning, you have to have to make many samples um, to get good quality. So, good quality means number one. Um, physically, they need to be intact. Right? So you make a wire that's 400 nanometer, but this long, and very easily they break. So that's number one. When you make them, you've got to be able to take them from there and put in a box and all that. Then that's number two. The attenuation needs to be low, okay? And the attenuation here is very low. There's maybe one dB, uh, maximum two dB, okay? Um, I mean, the loss, the loss of the entire sample. Uh, then number three, it needs to be uniform. If it's physically okay, low loss, but not uniform, then it doesn't help us because instead of a single peak for each mode, you start to see things like this. You see like a little peak here? A session was probably changed different, uh, the same like that. So it's hard to get them exactly uniform. And then number four, you make them, they have low loss, they are uniform, you put them in a box, you measure, Two days ago, the sample is lost. And what was that? I mean, uh, now we make a box that is like closed. It, it, it's in there, so there's no dust uh, falling on it. And now it lasts longer, but there's that as well. Um, and then the other question was about the, oh, the diameter. How do we know the diameter? diameter? Yeah. Actually, the way we know the diameter is also using, using what Philip mentioned yesterday, the Raman-like scattering. Because if I now measure the frequency of, so it was also measuring frequency, right? Like Philip mentioned that uh, if you want to measure something precise, measure the frequency. Um, it was also measuring frequency, but it was measuring the forward scattering. Okay? And if I go back to the dispersion relation, relation Remember the phase matching condition for forward is beta equal to zero. I mean, at the cutoff. And so, over here, at uh, the forward frequency is going to be this one. Those points right there. Not where it crosses here, but where it crosses at zero. And the dispersion relation is flat. So this means that the frequency is inversely proportional to the diameter. And that's uh, something for the uh, hands-on course that you guys are going to have. So you're going to measure that and then calculate the frequency based on the diameter. Oh, oh, the other way around. Measure the frequency and calculate the diameter based on the frequency. So the product frequency times diameter is a constant. That constant is given by simply the uh, material properties, uh, the speed of sound, uh, the longitudinal and acoustic waves. So there's a characteristic equation there that's the eigenvalue, and the cutoff frequency only depends on the diameter. So you measure the frequency precisely, you know the diameter precisely. So indirectly. indirectly, yes. Yeah, and we also know how uniform it is because if you have a well-defined frequency, that means you have a well-defined diameter. But if you have several peaks or a distribution, that means the diameter was changing. So we throw that sample away. Exactly, you would have a waste with diameter varying. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? Sweet. Hi, uh, I may have missed it. But in slide 62, can you put it again, please? There is a peak uh, that... Uh, that? Yeah. <laughs> is that product of randomness? I yeah, know. so that's a good question. And I'll go back to uh, the full spectrum uh, that we had. You see this peak is also here. Let me go to this right over here. Um, this is actually not a mode, not a real peak. I mean, it's not a real peak. It's not a, a mode of the waste. And it's, um, 
it comes up. Oh, that's not the slide that I want. Sorry. It's the previous one. That one. So, um, see, the, uh, the blue curve is what comes from the waist, right? So this is well-defined peaks because I'm assuming well-defined diameter, uniform, so on and so forth. The red curve is the integrated scattering in this region here. So each diameter scatters at a specific frequency. So as light propagates here, I am adding scattering at one frequency, another frequency, slightly shifted, slightly shifted, so I create sort of a bend, okay, which is this right there. Now, it's not uniform. It's not like a, it's not like that. Um, like you have one peak here and one peak there. It's not, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, and the reason is the efficiency also changes as you change the diameter. Okay, so as you, as you go along that direction here, then the frequency changes, but also the diameter changes. And so you form these structures um, that depend on this convolution between how the frequency is and where the amplitude is at a specific point here. Then you add them out. So that peak that you mentioned, is a result of the transition region. Thank you. Okay. Yeah? Which one? That's the problem slide. Yeah? This one? Yeah. What is the oh, good point. Yeah, that's what the single mode fiber pick. This is this is uh, this is what comes out from the pigtails, from the not from the sample itself, but from the the, the, the fiber coming into the sample, and after that. Uh, so this is the frequency. If you measure just single mode fiber, that's where you would be. At uh, 10.8, more or less 10.9 gigahertz. So it has nothing to do with the same. That's why it's like blocked. It's an artifact of the measurement. Yeah. Uh, how does the specific mode for going to be excited depend on the polarization of the signal? Yeah. If you, I, I want to know if you can excite a radio mode with visually for polarized light. That's a good question. Um, yes, you can excite a radio mode with linearly polarized light. In fact, the radio mode does not depend on the polarization. But the TR mode does depend on the polarization. Um, and uh, the TR mode, in fact, if you, um, if you control the, uh, the polarization to circular to the left or circular to the right, you change its phase. And, 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 and yeah, this, this, is, this is polarization dependent. This is not. Any more? Oi. Okay. Oi. Just wait for the microphone. Oi, it's Portuguese. How do you know the polarization that it's hit the, the polarization applied that's hit the taper? Good question. Um, um, this is part of what you should do in the experiment, but I'm um, going to have, okay, so the answer is that we don't know. We don't know. Uh, you don't know in advance because it's fiber. So after the circulator, you have you know some fiber that's coiled to the sample, and the polarization is changing as it propagates through the fiber. Um, so what we do is we control the polarization by looking at the scattered light. Okay, so we change the polarization even though we don't know what it is. We know also that the scattered is the scattered amplitude is going to depend on the polarization. So we maximize the intensity of the scattered peaks. That's how we know what it is, by not measuring it directly. It's indirectly again. Thank you. OK. All 
right? Mm. We asked you guys to ask questions. You did. Okay. You did yeah. ask, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's go for lunch. Go for lunch. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>